Welcome back. Following the panel discussion earlier this morning, we are very pleased to welcome Prof. Ulat again to share with us on the topic of science communication, why and how. The Q&A session will be moderated by Prof. Lim Teck Ning, Chief Executive of the Science Centre Board. Prof. Ulat, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start by saying how, how brilliant it is to be here and to have met so many of you. And I you know, feel really privileged to have been able to meet people from so many different countries um, during this week. So I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to come to Singapore and to experience this kind of um, sharing across such a huge range of different, different parts of science. So I, I found it really, really um, energising. So I'm going to talk to you today about, about public engagement and science communication and why I think it's important and how I think to go about doing it. I'm not saying I have all the answers by any means, but I'm going to share my own kind of experience and ideas with you. But I'm going to, particularly, I'm going to focus on storytelling and why telling stories is so important in communicating science. And I'm actually going to I'm not just talk about using stories to tell science, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the science of stories as well. Where do they come from? Um, why do they help us to understand the world so well? And, and so that's the aim here. So I'm going to start off by the whys of um, public engagement and science communication. Um, and some of them you're, 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 you're uh, obvious and others a little bit less obvious. But I guess to inspire the next generation of scientists, and I think... In the panel this morning, we talked a little bit about how, how this is so important at the moment and how science needs to be done by a very diverse range of individuals um, across borders, um, across socioeconomic groups, in order to build up the best knowledge that we can possibly have and the best way of understanding the world around us. And so sharing this sense of wonder about the world is another really important um, reason for me, I, I think that science is very good for my mental health. I know people will tell you that mental health is very bad in scientists and there's so much pressure and everything, but actually going into a lab every day and trying to find out more about the world is an enormous pleasure, privilege and gift. And I think sometimes we sort of forget that. But it's actually, I, I, it's, it sustains me so much. Not all just the work I do, but the work that everyone else does as well. So, Sharing this, this sense of wonder, that's why we all do science, because we all have questions about the world around us. I also think that science happens because of funding, and fun, a lot of funding is um, public money that's used. So being open and transparent about the, how that money is spent is really important. And I, another thing that we touched on in the panel this morning was um, why it's important for people to understand the process of science. And this is really important in counteracting mythology and, um, and um, you know, weird ideas that can, that, can, that can creep into science, conspiracy theories. Because it's important that people understand that science isn't just you do an experiment and suddenly you understand everything. It's, um, it's much more complicated than that. It's about building evidence, getting a weight of evidence, and, and it's iterative, so changing direction sometimes a little bit. You interpret your data because that's the data you have. And it might not be the perfect answer. We're not all, we're not guardians of the truth. Um, we're guardians of the best evidence available. And then as new evidence becomes available, because technology increases, then you might have to modify your original idea. And, and, and so, it, you know, people need to understand that it's not just, there's one truth and that's it. And it's not really a holy grail in much of what we do. And I think understanding the process, understanding what an experiment is, and why it's important to have a proper controlled experiment. At least we would say controlled experiment in my area of research. But recently, people are also using public engagement in some fields to actually influence the research itself. Um, so helping the public in, help involving the public in helping to formulate uh, a research question or a project and to consult the public on, on views about their work. And that needs to acknowledge both the wisdom and the sensitivities of the audience um, around, around us. So there's much more movement in the area of actually collaborating and co-creating 
um, science with, with members of the, of the public. And so the overall aim is to increase trust. And we talked about trust this morning um, in, uh, in, in the panel. So um, uh, trust is something that's easily eroded in science. Um, so we, there's lots of examples from the past and also from the present, why the MMR vaccine was suddenly came under such criticism because apparently it was linked with, with autism. That turned out to be wrong. Um, vaccine hesitancy, climate change denial are all areas where, um, where trust in science can easily be eroded. So overall, we're, we're increasing trust and we're helping to democratize science. We're helping to make what scientists do more accessible to, um, to everybody in society. And so that's part of, I think, negotiating the, 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 the license that, um, that universities and research institutes have to practice science. It's about rebalancing, in some ways, power between institutions and citizens. And so that democratic aspect is something that I'm really interested in. So you'll, you'll have learned by now that I use the words science communication and public engagement pretty much interchangeably. Um, but there's, there's subtle differences between the two, and it's worth thinking about them, although I think what I do is both. So the idea is that communication is a, is a bit of a one-way channel of information from the person who knows to the person who doesn't know. And um, that can be useful in some ways, and it can be um, disengaging in, in, in other ways. And it comes from the, the idea that there's a deficit in public understanding of science that needs to be filled. Okay? And that, that, can, that can have problems because, you know, some people, don't, they don't see the relevance. They don't understand why it is they need to know this stuff. And that's why engagement can be more powerful because it's a two-way process. It's about listening as well as talking. Um, it's about seeking views. But, of course, that sometimes isn't the right way forward because you might overestimate the public's willingness to engage in, in, in whatever it is you want to engage them with. They might actually want to just receive information sometimes. So that's why I think there's a happy medium between the two and why I tend to use the terms interchangeably. And then thinking about um, why, uh, why now, a bit more about the why, this erosion of trust in science. I think it has not been helped by our politicians of recent years, um, th th this uh, trust of science. So the, the first guy on the left is Michael Gove, who's a British politician. And he, had, he got in a lot of trouble for saying that um, people in this country have had enough of experts. In other words, he was kind of degrading the expertise and he was saying that opinion is important as well. And that, that was very problematic in the, in, the, in the science community, as you can imagine. And then, of course, we've had Donald Trump, who really has not helped the cause of science either, putting out all sorts of crazy ideas um, on the internet and beyond. And then I've put a quote in on the right-hand side from Sarah Palin, which most of you won't remember. So Sarah Palin was, <coughs> excuse me, was, the, um, was the senator for Alaska um, a few years ago. And she actually ran for vice president alongside Obama and Biden when they actually won the presidential campaign. She was um, in the opposition. And she started to attack science. So she said, Dollars go to projects that have little or nothing to do with the public good. Things like fruit fly research in Paris, France. I kid you not. I'm sure, um, are there any fruit fly workers in the audience? Yeah, right. So a very unhelpful, a very unhelpful thing to, to say. And, the, and the, the community, the model organism community in general, was very quick to, to get out there with all their examples of how this sort of work has completely revolutionized um, the way that we think about biology and indeed medicine. So these are the reasons I think why it's really important for, for scientists to engage, to make sure that these, these, these crazy ideas don't get um, too much airtime. But I think on the other hand, there's also an opportunity at the moment to capitalize on the, on the scientific response to the pandemic, for example, and the public trust that has been engendered because of that. I think a lot of people's interest in science are shot up during the pandemic because they can see that science offers solutions to, to global problems that seem insurmountable. You know, the vaccines have got dug us out of an enormous hole and that has increased um, people's uh, interest and excitement and... I'm being modified here. 
Is that better? You're happy with, happy with that? No oh, good. Makes, it's made my voice go much deeper. No, I'm telling you. <laughs> Less squeaky. How interesting. Um, yeah. So, so, so they're, they're all good reasons to, um, to, to, to communicate your science. And I, but I, I do think um, in the panel, again, someone made the, um, made the uh, comment that there weren't many scientists in politics. Well, there weren't many politicians who had been trained in science. Are we good? We're going to have another go. Okay, oh, even lower. Is that better? Are you sure you're happy? You're happy. <laughs> okay. So I think it would be a better, the world would be a better place if, uh, if more politicians had a scientific training. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it have made a difference? So... Uh, to be a bit more serious, though, um, and, and I'd like to um, give you a quote from Carl Sagan, who was a wonderful um, astronomer and also a science communicator who I've taken a lot of inspiration from in my own work. And he said, um, in the way that scepticism is sometimes applied to issues of public concern, there's a tendency to belittle, to, condes to condescend, to ignore the fact that, deluded or not, supporters of superstition and pseudoscience are human beings with real feelings who, like the skeptics, are trying to figure out how the world works and what our role in it might be. Their motives are in many ways consonant with, with science. If their culture has not given them all the tools they need to pursue this great quest, let us temper our criticism with kindness, because none of us come fully equipped. And I think that's a really good idea to have in your mind when you're communicating with the public. It's not that people are stupid and you're not, and you can tell them what it is they need to know, um, it's, it's, it's a different contract than that. And we have to understand where people's uh, skepticism and where their disbelief and their, their alternative belief systems come from if we're to engage with them. So this is um, a public opinion survey in the UK, Public Attitudes to Science. They're published quite regularly. This one is a little bit old now. Um, but I think the, the, the findings would be broadly similar if it was done um, today. Uh, I've actually been involved in one of these surveys very recently, and it's going to be published soon, but I'm not allowed to say anything about it. But the headline is it's not. It's, it's in line with this. So 84% of the public agree that science is such a big part of our lives that we should all take an interest. But only 45% feel informed about science and research. So that illustrates the gap that can exist, that we, ha that we kind of have a good reason to try to plug um, as, as scientists. So who are the public? The public are you. The public are, are the scientists who are in a different field. The public are your children, your, um, your colleagues, the people that you went to university with, the people that um, are going to serve you when you go shopping. They're everybody. They're also policymakers and politicians. And, and, and so it's, in, it's really important to realize that you can, you can have what you think is a public audience and that they all have exactly the same kind of lack of knowledge, they all have come from the same place, and they, but actually they're hugely diverse, and you never know quite who you're talking to and how what you're saying is going to be interpreted by them. So that's about the public. And then why might you want to get involved in science communication? And I think there's a lot in it for you. It's not, it's not all about giving, it's also about receiving, and that's an important part of the contract. So it's about developing your skills, it's about stimulating your creativity often in research and innovation, enriching your career, motivating and inspiring you, gaining new research perspectives. I was talking with, um, with David Kleneman just, just before we came in here about um, how when you have to try to distill the real kind of nugget of what it is you're doing in order to tell somebody that has no idea about it, actually, that's really hard. And that requires you to have a very deep level of understanding about your science. And by, by going through that, that process, you can actually gain a deeper understanding and, and learn more. So I think gaining perspectives is really important. It also might raise your personal and institutional profile. It might allow you to have more influence and in networking. You may um, find new collaborators and new partnerships with people that you never would have thought that you would interact with scientifically or even around in, in, in the communication space. And finally, 
last but not least, enjoyment and personal reward. So um, I've said for me, science is good for my mental health. I, I like the idea of finding out about the world, right? I don't always like the process and the failed experiments and the rejected papers and the rejected grants and all that. That's different. But the actual, the aim is, 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 is something that has a huge amount of joy in it that is great to share with other people. So you can only accompany your public on, your, on their voyage of discovery if you've thought really hard about your science and you've worried a lot about the little bits that don't quite fit. And I think that's really important. And don't be afraid of exposing these. Actually, your public, your public audience will love it when you tell them about the bit that doesn't quite fit or the bit that's missing, the dot, dot, dot. You know, people love that kind of journey. They find it absolutely fascinating. So you need to listen to your own explanations, I think. You need to listen to your narrative, find out where the holes are. Um, find out, think, where is this hard to follow? Always practice talks or podcasts or whatever it is you're doing, conversations, discussions. Find out where the holes are, where the, where the missing beat is. That's really important. And maybe that also might tell you something about where the holes are in your own research. Yeah? And the things that you need to, to concentrate on in the future. So how can you get involved? And there's an enormous diversity. I mean, I do tend to give a lot of talks, but I'm a bit of a dinosaur. But there are huge things, a number of things you can do um, now. So podcasts, science, comedy. Actually, that's something that I have started doing. It was the one thing I never would have thought I would ever be able to do. And I had a friend who's a comedian, and, and I said, God, I don't know how you do what, I do what you do. I'd never be able to be a comedian, to say, do anything remotely funny, ever. And they said, well, that's obviously the thing that you need to try next. Um, and I did, and actually, I love it. I find it amazing to talk about science and it, from a comedy point of view. I'm, you know, engage people by, by, you know, by, by talking about your project in all the kind of crazy craziness that we, I mean I work on nematode worms right that are tiny and hermaphrodite so that they're, they're they're females that produce their own sperm and that is comedy gold I can tell you you know but in in amongst that that comedy and those laughs and you you can get your message across in a very different way to a very different audience so I you know do have a go at that um, so games uh, science festivals and this is a, a DNA, DNA acrobats at the Crick Institute. Um, so all, all sorts of different things. You don't have to go out and give talks. There's lots and lots of things um, that you can do. Uh, writing, being a volunteer at a festival, doing things in teams so that, it, it, that, so that it's easier. Um, but I was just going to say a little bit about the Royal Institution um, and the Christmas lectures, because that was my kind of first major foray into doing something really, really public. Uh, like making a, a TV show. And um, it was the most extraordinary experience. I don't know if any of you know about the Royal Institution in London, but um, it's basically um, a, a sort of um, centre for public understanding of science. And uh, it, it was an institution that did research of its own until fairly recently, but it's always had a very strong public science thread and now it's really only devoted to, to public understanding and public engagement with science. And the public engagement um, thread and arm of um, Royal Institution was set up by Michael Faraday. So Michael Faraday discovered the concept of electromagnetism and um, he was the found, he, his work was the foundation of the electric motor and practical uses of electricity. So you can see immediately that that has revolutionized our world. It's hard to think of anything that has done more than electricity um, commonly used for our, for our civilization and our society. But Michael Faraday had almost no formal education. He came from a very poor family. <coughs> Excuse me. He left school at 16. He became an apprentice to a bookbinder. And it was as an apprentice to a bookbinder that he started to read because there were books everywhere. And that's how he became interested in science and he educated himself in science. And then he got an apprenticeship to Sir Humphrey Davy, who was working in the Royal Institution and was starting to work on problems like electromagnetism. But it was, it was Faraday that really sorted a lot of that stuff out. 
And Faraday felt very strongly all the way through that there's no point doing any of this unless you tell people about it. And so he started the Royal Institution Lectures in 1825. And they were so popular in Victorian London that the, the street that the Royal Institution is on is called Albemarle Street. And that was, it was the, that's the first one-way street because there were so many carriages coming to Albemarle Street to hear these lectures that there was massive traffic jams and nobody could move for hours. And so they decided to set up a one-way flow of traffic in order to avoid the, the traffic jams. So that's how popular science communication was in the 1820s. There was so much going on in science that people wanted to find out more about it. So I was incredibly privileged um, to, to find myself delivering these lectures um, in 2013. And it was a huge, important experience for me. And it, and it started that kind of aspect of my, my working life off, I suppose, in a, much, in a much bigger and more impactful way. And I just, it's a very different way when you're, being, when you're doing a TV um, production, though. It's a very different uh, team involved. So these are the sorts of lists of, of the people that were involved in putting those programs together. So the, the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures are, um, have to involve a lot of demonstrations and experiments. And there's meant to be like one demonstration every two minutes, which is quite daunting when you think that you've got to put three 60-minute lectures together. And so some of the props that we used are, are on the right-hand side. Um, there. And all of these people involved from the BBC, from, you know, all, I had no idea. I didn't even know what a, what a script supervisor or a floor supervisor was in TV production. But, you know, I kind of learnt a lot of these things along the way. So that was a, an amazing experience. And of course, you also work with a script. You have to write the script to start with, but then it gets taken over. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the crew decides, you know, all these things like we had worm cam TV involved, which I found was a very funny concept um, at the time to look at our C. elegans worms um, on TV. So I'm going to summarize this part of my talk then by saying that with my top tips for, um, for communicating your science, and they're in no particular order, but the first one I think is probably is, re is really important. Don't, don't just talk, listen. So listen to, listen to your audience. Um, try and find out about them beforehand, if possible. But listen to what they tell you. Listen to their stories, because that, that's where they're coming to your science with their own experience. And it's important for you to know that when you interact with them. Work out what you're good at and do that. Yeah? Don't make yourself give big lots of loads of talks if actually you really hate doing that. Although it does get easier over time, and you do need to practice and every scientist needs to be able to give a decent talk at some stage or other in their career. So I would say, do, do try and, and talk to people, give talks. Um, but when you first start, you can volunteer, you can make a team, you don't have to do everything on your own. Don't just do it to tick a box. Right? You, you do it because you think it's a really important part of your, of your work. Don't say, well, I've got to do some public engagement, otherwise, I don't know, my boss is going to be upset with me, so I'm going to do this get it out of the way because that that means that the quality won't be so good and the final thing that I want to say is that it, the really really good um, science communication is all about telling stories and w when we've heard all of the amazing talks this week that's what they've been they've been great stories then they kind of had a plot line and, and you follow we followed them and we've become in, involved in that story and want to know what happens next and um, because all of the speakers this week have been really great um, communicators. So I'm going to tell a little bit of, of a story about stories now. Um, so, um, so we share our science by telling stories. Um, at least that's when it works best. But what is the science of storytelling? Where do stories come from and why are they so important? So we all love a good story. I'm reading, I, I finished a novel last night, too late actually, because I should have been asleep. And I felt really empty at the end of it because I finished it. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do now? I don't know what, I've got to wait till I get back to the airport and buy another book to read. So <coughs> we, we, all, we all love um, a good story. I think following a story actually exercises our neurons in much the same way as learning does. And neuroscientists will tell you that. So we're tuned into stories. 
But, but where do they come from and why, why is storytelling so useful for science? So we can look around the biological world and we can find some storytelling, actually. So this, these, are, these are social insects. Um, they're communities with very few conflicts of interest. Okay, that's really important in why their stories work so well. So this is the waggle dance. I don't know if any of you know, you, some of you probably know more about the waggle dance than I am because I'm not a... I don't work on social insects, but it's a dance that gives information about sources of food. So it tells you about the direction of the food and it tells you how far away it is. So it's very, quite sophisticated information. And you can see how these sorts of elaborate behavioral signaling systems can evolve in the social insects because there's no conflict, especially there's no sexual conflict. So communities of, of social insects are um, sterile workers like these, these bees. So the interest of the workers then is to, is to feed and raise the nests, the, the brood, and not to reproduce by themselves. It's all about the queen. So cheating, going, finding the food and keeping it all for yourself is pointless. Uh, cheating your sister would be just like cheating yourself. And that stability, that lack of conflict, means that the waggle dance can become more sophisticated and over evolution. So it's thought to be around 20 million years old, the waggle dance. And it's like a story because it enables others to experience something and learn from it, okay? But this stability means that it has a chance to evolve ever more elaborate routines. But it's a story, it's storytelling in the biological world. And we can find another one in the primates. Um, so there's a great experiment done by uh, Emile Menzel some, some years ago. And um, I, I find this really, really a real great um, bit of storytelling among the primates. And <coughs> Sorry. The experiment was to, to hide food in the, in the enclosure of these chimpanzees and only um, show the hiding place to one of them. And the, the, the primate that was, um, was chosen to be told, be shown where the, where the food was, was called Belle. And Belle um, was very warm-hearted, a very warm-hearted warm -heart, heart um, chimp, but diminutive. And when all the chimps were let back into the into the enclosure, Belle immediately got the food and she shared it with everybody. Um, and then as they repeated the experiment, so the results changed because another chimp called Rock, and Rock was more of a bruiser, okay? Rock decided that he was going to wait until, Bella, uh, until Belle showed everyone where the food was and then he would take the food and have it all for himself. We didn't want to share, right? And so... What Belle did was she stopped showing Rock where the food was, or she, shopped, she stopped showing anyone where the food was when Rock was around. Okay. In fact, what she did was she sat on it and she kept it concealed. But Rock, well, he wised up to this, okay. and he started shoving Belle out of the way so that he could see what she was sitting on, because there was the food. And then Belle, she wised up to this, so she thought, hmm, not having this. So I'm going to sit away from the food, cause a kind of decoy, and that rock won't know where the food is. So what did rock do? Well, he started peeping over his shoulder to see where Belle was, because she went, she, 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 she moved when, he, when she thought that he wasn't looking. So this conflict of interest then over food has led to an arms race of deception and counter-deception in this story, in the, in the story that the primates were telling each other. So, and the arms race acts as a huge accelerator for intelligence, okay? In this, in this particular case, the experiment has led to the suggestion that the increase in brain size and intelligence in primates was driven more by the need to deal with the complexity of social interactions, actually, than by the need to make tools, for example. And it's, called, it's known as the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis. So then, two nice examples of storytelling in the world around us. Um, but what about us? So in humans, how long has storytelling been a thing? And it turns out that we've been telling stories ever since we developed language, because they're a way of making sense of the world. We've been telling stories in one form or another for tens of thousands of years, and they probably predate the cave painting. So this cave painting here is thought to be about 40,000 years old. Um, so because they're so ancient, we're evolutionarily tuned to them. But why did we start telling them? Because we want to share knowledge. We want to make sense of the world. 
And, that, and that's very pertinent to science. We'll come back to that later. So the bees pass knowledge on with a waggle dance, but it's slow. It requires great social stability and cooperation and huge evolutionary time. Primates pass knowledge on, but in a limited and more primitive way. But we humans, we use language. And that's the big difference. We use language to share knowledge, and that's super fast in the form of stories. So storytelling and learning are fundamentally connected. Story, stories, lap, uh, stories tap into our social, into our neural learning mechanisms. So why did we start telling them then? Um, sorry, before I, but I go on to that, I'm going to say actually the story is a two-headed beast. Stories can be both positive and negative. They can inform, share, educate, engage, entertain, but they can also deceive, mislead, conceal, manipulate. Stories can both inform on the one hand and deceive on the other. So you remember the arms race in behavior between Bell and Rock. There's also an arms race in storytelling between truth and deception. And this is going to, be turn, this is going to turn out to be really important when we think about the origins of science. Because the scientific method seeks to resolve the conflict between truth and falsity. And we'll come back to this. But just to start with some very early stories, human stories were probably um, honest and they were probably around altruistic acts. So here we have, um, uh, this is bear coming, follow me, right? The problem, the bear, the resolution, I'm running away. If you want to, if you want to follow me, you might get away from the bear. So storytelling didn't need sophisticated language and great intelligence, and it may have been established among close kin because then it would be more favored by natural selection. But as soon as you have this kind of honest signaling, you have scope for dishonest signaling. Come into my cave. There's a bear coming. Or maybe not. So you need to be able to spot the deception, okay? And what are the strategies to spot this deception? Well, empirical contradiction has to be the best one. There's no, no bear comes. The story is false. It doesn't work. Okay. Maybe the female becomes less trusting of that male in the future. So evidence mounts against the veracity of the story. Maybe that, maybe that fact is then shared. What about if, if she shares her knowledge with others? The, 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 the male... Cave, the caveman may acquire a reputation. There's potentially a cost to his lie. So lies can be detected through self-contradiction. Through, through empirical contradiction or through self-contradiction. Okay? You might ask for help, promising to return the favor later on, but then you refuse to help in return. So the person who helped you is going to feel deceived and trust you less. So the better you can detect the deceit, the more of an evolutionary advantage you might have, okay? So the stories need to get better, more convincing. And then the lies need to get better, more convincing. And so there's an arms race between truth and deception, but this time in storytelling. So through the use of language rather than through behavior. So the Machiavellian intelligence then works at a new level, not just on behavior, but on what is being said. So the process depends then on a balance between trust and distrust. Too much trust and liars will get away with murder. Too, 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 um, too little trust, too much distrust, and there's no need to communicate at all. Nobody says anything. But with each held in check through the storytelling arms race, intelligence grows. So the two-headed nature of stories to inform on the one hand, to deceive on the other, may have been a key driver in the evolution of human intelligence. Eventually, Storytelling gets very sophisticated. It evolves into fiction, which conveys truth through an imaginary um, chain of events. So gradually, the causal chains then in stories become more elaborate and become more engaging. You end up with great fiction. We may learn from the stories and be entertained. Good stories may make us wiser. They may help us construct our world. And by following the story, we're taken on a journey and our neural models may be modified as a result. But isn't that the opposite of science that concerns itself with worldly observations? According to J.B.S. Haldane, science begins with doubt. So Copernicus doubted that the sun went around the earth. He had a theory to replace the old one. 
And his observations and experiments were largely designed to support that theory. But as time went on, this theory too was found wanting. Planets don't go around the sun in perfect circles. Gravity is much more complex than that. So scientists look for contradictions. If a contradiction is found, then a better explanation is needed. So the tools then that scientists use seeking empirical or logical contradictions are the very same as those used to detect lies. Now that doesn't of course mean that the false hypothesis is, is meant to deceive in science, it isn't. It may simply be the best explanation of the available data. So through stories then we honed our skills in causal reasoning and finding contradictions in working out whether someone was speaking the truth or not. And in science we apply those skills to stories about the natural world. If we were as honest as the honeybees with no drive to deceive, then there'd be no room for doubt. We would just accept. But we're storytelling animals. Through stories, we honed our skills in this way. Not going on very well. So science was born then when skills developed to detect contradictions in, 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 in stories. Um, Science was born when skills which we developed to detect contradictions in stories were applied to our sayings about the world, so as to get closer to the truth. So in sharing their knowledge then, scientists invite constant checking and refining, sometimes even turning a hypothesis on its head. And this culture of honest investigation then with nature as the ultimate arbiter allowed science to make rapid progress. This is just one view of the science timeline, just to, just to show you how rapid progress can be. I think it's no, constants that, no coincidence that the motto of the Royal Society, which is the Science Academy in the UK, is nullius in verba, which means, is Latin for take nobody's word for it. So we employ storytelling principles, so detecting contradi contradictions um, in science. And we've detected, what we've developed over evolution then is this remarkable storytelling lie detector. Uh, and then we found that we could use this to arrive at other truths. But storytelling doesn't just provide the basic skills and motivations for science, as I've, as I've told you about. It provides the mechanisms for scientists to share knowledge. And so in the last um, few minutes, I'm just going to, to tell you about how to construct your science into a, into a story. So why do stories work for science? Well, they hold our attention. <coughs> Nobody would listen if there was a string of facts were just read out. And the craft of the story is the thing that makes us want to know more. And we get the chance to experience things that have never happened to us. Problems we'd never thought about before. I've thought about a lot of problems I've never thought about before in science by being here and listening to the amazing talks. We pay attention because they might be useful later on. They also help with recall and comprehension. So researchers have shown that... Uh, um, that, that recall of a list of random nouns is improved six to sevenfold when they're woven into a story. It's very hard to remember a list, but it's very easy to remember a story. Now, science is actually full of stories, and we talked about a little, we touched on this a little bit in the panel this morning. Um, the stories in science are the results, but they're also hope and passion and commitment. Often the stories are left out, actually, and I think sometimes um, science maybe is the worst, is a little bit the worse for it. Um, it would, be, it would be better if we brought more of the story into our science. It's very hard to do in the written paper. I don't know about you, but my heart always thinks, sinks when my colleagues ask me to read their papers and comment on them. I think, what, the whole paper from start to finish? You know, it can be, it can be a bit of a task. But, you know, I do it because they're my colleagues and I love them. Um, but I, sometimes they can be quite boring. And if a little bit more of this story was, was there, a little bit more of the motivation, the, the context, the whys, the how we got to where we got, I think actually it would be better. But it's very easy to put that kind of material into a talk or a podcast or some other um, communication. So how do you tell a great story? So most stories have the same structure. And most stories are about someone trying to achieve something. So there's setup, there's conflict, and there's resolution. That's the basic storytelling um, idea. So the setup is of, a, of a story story is, a, is the background, the character's life, what initiates them working towards their goal. Or in science, what's the problem in science that you're trying to address? Why is that interesting? 
The conflict, the middle of the story, the tension, what's stopping them from realizing their goal? In science, you know, what's, what's your approach? Why is this difficult? What challenges did you need to overcome? And then the resolution, the wrap up, could be a denouement. What did you find? Why did that change the way we think or add to the data or, you know, just crystallize this, these, uh, this, this area of science a little bit more? Cause and effect is really important in a great story. Something happens which triggers the next thing, which triggers the next thing. So uh, logical flow really helps our brains, right? It's really important in a science story that things don't seem to happen at random. Our brains hate that. They find it very difficult to compute. So there's lots of ways of telling a story. There's words, there's text, there's imagery. What you're doing is you're making a movie inside your audience's head, okay? And it's actually very similar to the, to the, to the, to the structure that Disney used. This is, if you go, um, if you, this is actually from someone I met who works for, for Disney and is a screenwriter. And that, this is how they write, they call it Pixar's story spine, but it's actually stolen from, from other ideas about storytelling. And it's called Freytag's Pyramid. So there's the exposition, there's some sort of inciting incident, there's the rising action, the climax, the falling action, and the resolution. So you can see exactly the same structure. So whenever you write a screenplay for a Disney movie, you have to use this structure, these paragraphs. Once upon a time, blah, 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 blah. Every day, blah, blah, blah. Until one day, blah, blah, blah. Because of that, blah, 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 blah. And because of that, everyone lived happily ever after. And that's the structure that everybody at Disney um, has to use. So I thought that was a very interesting kind of analogy. So what about your story then? What story do you want to tell? How do you find the story in your work? In your work? And it can be quite difficult. I find a really, um, a really useful tool is to play But Why. But you need a friend to play But Why with. It's a bit daft if you do it on your own. But with your colleagues. It's about explaining your work in one sentence. Um, and then what your, what your partner does is they pick one word or phrase and attach it to But Why. And they keep going. So here's an example, right? Um, I research proteins that build up in the brain and can cause Alzheimer's disease. I don't actually, but I thought I'd take the perspective of someone who did. But why? Well, Alzheimer's, what, why Alzheimer's? Um, because Alzheimer's is just such a common disease and it has such an impact on people's lives. But why can it have such an impact on people's lives? Well, because it affects your memory. And that's so important to who you are. But why is memory so important? Because our lives are shaped by memories and losing them is like losing a part of yourself and so on. But why, but why, but why, but why? And that is the thing that distills out the story. The other thing you need to do when you're putting your story together is to think about your audience. Define them. Who are they? What's your message? What do you want to gain from this? What do you think they want to gain from this? How do you use language? How do you avoid jargon? What does your audience really need in order to understand your story? What's the, what's the nuggets that they need to link the concepts together? Okay, And that's vital. Because you could tell a different story depending on the audience and the message that you want to, to give. So you, you cut away the unnecessary detail. Okay. And then you need a good hook. You need a way to get people involved right at the beginning. Start with the hook. Keep the suspense. In biology, which is my field, it's often a beautiful image. Images are so, so helpful in, 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 in the biological sciences and, and in others in physics, in, ast in astronomy as well. Because the, the scene that you can create compels viewers to ask, what's going on here? Who are these people? Who are these animals? What is this a picture of? Um, and what do they want? So it's no accident that films often start with a frenetic action-packed scene, like in this James Bond movie. Often, actually, the scene doesn't really have that much to do with the rest of the story, but it actually gets you really involved in watching it. Huh? In, 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 in your science story, it's much more that the, the hook is the big picture, that maybe your work doesn't quite answer because it could be a really big question in biology, but it would be a way of illustrating that. And then in a, in a, in a written paper, I've, got, I've, got, I've just got the um, beginning of uh, Watson and Crick's paper on DNA structure, and I love the way that they start that. Um, we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribose nucleic acid, this structure has novel features which are of considerable biological interest. No kidding, right? Bit of an understatement, but a very effective tool um, in that particular story. 
So that's how you start. And then you have to take your audience on a journey. I think metaphors and analogies can be useful. I think making it personal is really useful. And I think, think carefully about the ending. Well, what's the message? What's the feeling? Do you need to sum up? You need a strong finish. How do you take people to the end of your story with you? And I've just got two really nice endings. One is from um, Darwin's Origin of Species. And he ends by saying, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. I know that he was doing something quite profound in his book, and maybe sometimes your research doesn't feel that profound. But if you can end strong, I think it's, it really helps. And then the end of um, the Watson and Crick paper, I think, is another a good example of understatement, which is really effective, actually. It's not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests um, a, a powerful... Um, I can't actually read this, a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material, right? It ends you wanting to know more. It's a real denouement at the end of that, of that story. So I've got to the end of what I want to say. Um, I've suggested then that, that a major contributing factor to the evolution of human language and intelligence was an arms race between truth and deception in storytelling. And that that's a, also was a process that's critical for un for establishing our abilities and our motivations to do science. So biologically speaking, I think there's very little to, little to distinguish our brains from those of our cave-dwelling ancestors, but storytelling has undergone a kind of runaway evolution through cultural processes and the technologies that go with that. So printing and travel and the internet, stories inhabit every part of our lives. So storytelling has allowed human intelligence to become a collective intelligence. And that operates not only in the present, but it reaches into the future and it reaches into the past. Because like DNA, the stories are passed on from one generation to the next. So I think the challenge for the future then will be to ensure that the stories based on the values of honesty, doubt, evidence and reason, and which lie at the heart of science, are more powerful and, and effective than those based on deception, the fake news and the conspiracy theories. But if we all work with the storytelling principles of detecting logical or empirical contradictions, I think they will be. So, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ulat. We now invite Prof. Lim to moderate the Q&A. Thank you. <coughs> right. Well, thank you, Alison. Uh, I certainly learned a lot from you. I like the way you put the science of story and story of science into this lecture. And I think uh, all of our audience here must have learned a lot, just like I had. And I agree with them, I'm sure, that the tips that you give will be very helpful for them, especially when they develop a career in telling the wonder of the science that they work on. I'd like to start off first by uh, uh, my own personal question because you were among a few that were selected to present in the Faraday Lecture Hall, the Christmas, Royal Institution Christmas Lecture. And you give us a hint of how much is involved in that. Can you just enlighten us? Because among here, some of them might be the future <laughs> lecture for Christmas uh, series in, in Faraday. Did you have to apply for it or you were uh, way selected? Because I understand there's a long process behind, and, and were there auditions, for example? I don't know if... It, oh, yes, it is working. Um, that's actually quite a funny story, because I got an email <clears throat> from the Royal Institution saying, um, we think that you might be a good candidate for the Christmas lectures, and would you like to just give us a little paragraph about what your lectures might be on, if they're in the area of genetics, developmental biology sort of thing? And I actually thought that that was a joke. I thought, you know, I get a lot of emails from, oh, will you do this or speak at this conference that's nothing to do with your research area or whatever. And I just skim through these emails and I kind of ignore a lot of them. So I, I didn't read it properly, was the answer. And then a, few, a couple of weeks later, they emailed me again. 
And they said, most people really reply to this email very quickly. <laughs> Say yes, please. <laughs> So, you know, do you, have you just missed it or whatever? And at that point, I read it properly and I thought, oh, my God, this is, uh, this is big potatoes. So then I, I did um, get in touch with them and I wrote a, a paragraph. I remember I was at a scientific conference at the time and I told my colleagues, I've, I've written this paragraph about potentially giving the Christmas lectures. And they're like, what? No way. And, uh, yeah, it, it all went from there. So, yeah, so... Um, you ha I had to do a screen test, audition type thing, uh, and yeah, it, it went from there. Yeah. Right, right. And uh, well, we had the privilege of having you here in Singapore. Yeah. In fact, she, she yeah. was invited uh, by ASTAR and us, the Science Centre uh, Singapore, uh, to deliver her version of the Christmas lecture in London, in Singapore at that time, because we were sponsored by ASTAR. It was called the Star Lecture. And if you're interested in her talk, we still have the DVD and the link. Right. And the oh. Christmas lectures come here every year, so they'll be coming in the summer. Yep. The right. Ones. Yeah. Okay. And, and I like the way you put it that uh, storytelling is falsifying the lies and verifying the truth. And I, I can see the parallel in that because I think many of us, when we do research, we always have got this hypothesis testing. Mm. And as a, as a young scientist, when we started learning to do science research, we were told to how to falsify and reject hypotheses. So is that also a way of um, doing not just science itself, but in terms of science communication and, and, and when you deal with so-called, uh, I don't know whether you've been engaged by a journalist to mm -hmm. ask you to verify and, and, and mm -hmm. probably comment on certain yeah, it can be it can be a good yeah. way to communicate because yep. it goes along the, the the lines of, well, it could be this, but actually it was shown not to be this. So then it could be this, but right. it showed not to be this. So then it's this, and this is the thing that that the idea that stands the test of time, which is how we sort of determine the best explanations for processes in the world at the moment. The one that lasts the longest before it's kind of thrown down as a heap of junk and replaced by something else. So yeah, I think it can work very well to communicate. Right, and, and you also alluded to the point that uh, science communication is a one-way thing and, and people are now moving more towards the science engagement part. Uh, there is a, a, a question here. Uh, I tried to put it up, but it doesn't seem to go up. But anyway, I'll read it out from, from here. Um, Oh, before that, I should, I, I should give this comment. This is the best presentation about science communication that I ever heard. Somebody say that. So thank you for, <laughs> for, for inspiring them. Okay, thank you. Right, so that's a great comment. Thank you. Uh, from uh, Rutai Con Street. Okay. Um, there, there is one uh, uh, comment here about... Uh, there's a trend... Uh, well, this, this person who, who sent in anonymously said that at least in computer science that a paper tells a fancy story but lacks solid foundation for it. What's your view on such a trend? I don't know whether this trend is uh, really a pervasive trend. Have you come across trends like oh, this? Oh, yeah, we would call that triumph of spin over substance. Okay. Yeah, it's very common. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it, there, is, there, there is a tendency for scientists to kind of hyperbolize their work because they want to get the grant, they want to get the paper in a high-impact journal, there's all that pressure going on. And it's a problem because it then gets very hard to detect the, not the lie, I'm not saying that this, any of this is falsified in any way, but it's the, maybe that's not the most important gene in that pathway that they've, they've discovered. Maybe there are other things that are more important. Um, <clears throat> so I do think that it, it's beholden on all of us to have some sense of, reality and self-criticism about the importance of our work because that means it in the it will stand the test of time much better and it's uh, and it's about the, the you know the picture emerging of how the world works accurately mm -hmm. but, um, but I, you know I, we're not going to solve the problem of competition and in science here i don't think <laughs> right okay um i thought this would be very appropriate for you to give advice to uh, if somebody is shy, introverted, how can they communicate? Yeah, um, practice helps a lot. I think I'm actually quite shy and introverted. Um, 
you, some of you might doubt that, but actually I think yeah. it's true. And I think a lot of scientists that are re give amazing talks are really shy and introverted. You know, I don't think scientists right. are the best collection of extroverts. So it's good, think, as, it's, I, it's, <laughs> it's good to see that we have people who are non-shy and they are stepping forward. Uh, so shall we start with you? Oh, hi. I study physics, but I have never done any serious science communication beyond trying to explain quantum mechanics to my family, which, you know, you know is already challenging enough. So, yeah, that's uh, quite serious, I would say. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, the question is that are there or should there be a system of regulations on science communicators to prove whether or not they qualify to do it? Because I see mm -hmm. that basically everyone can be one by setting up an account and start hosting. So there, there might be, there can be irresponsible scientific communication. Yeah. Mm. Right. It'd be very hard to imagine a kind of licensing system, wouldn't yeah. it? And maybe that wouldn't be very inclusive. Um, I, I kind of think the community kind of is quite self-regulating. So if somebody rises to prominence by talking a load of nonsense on Twitter or whatever, it tends to get regulated by other scientists saying, no, this is wrong because of X, Y, and Z. So I do think there's an awful lot of self-regulation that, that mm. goes on. Yep. It, right. Maybe sometimes it's not because, uh, because in, in my country, uh, there are lots of cases there. It just went unregulated. Fam famous people just yeah. do a yeah. irresponsible yeah. communication. Right, right, yeah, yes. yeah. Well, so, it can happen, yeah. Yes, yes. And we have to stand up as scientists to tell the truth. Please, yeah. Uh, hi, Prof. Uh, thank you so much for the very engaging presentation. Uh, my question actually goes back to more of the start of your presentation when you mentioned about outreach and like comedy and stuff. So in my opinion, I feel that um, some fields lend themselves better to comedy and outreach and engagement than others. Uh, what would be your comment on this? And also like, uh, what do you think uh, scientists in like not so relatable fields can do to better engage the public about their research. Thank you. I mean, I've been to quite a lot of science comedy um, things now, and, and I've even been a judge on this thing called Fame Lab, which is when um, PhD students have three minutes to present their thesis in a, in a funny way. <laughs> and I'm always amazed by how you can, you, can, you, can, you can use that platform for any kind of science. And it might sound incredibly dull when you look at the title. And I'm always blown away because I'm roaring with laughter in the first minute or so, you know. Um, and I find it a really, really good way to learn about new fields that I have no idea about. So I, I wouldn't say you, your, you know, your work is either funny or it isn't. You've got to find the, find the amusing story in that. And it might be about your experiences as a human being working in that field that where, where that sort of rich story is. Yep. Yeah? The next. Right. We, have, we have two and a half minutes, so it's got to be quick. Yeah, thank you very much for the, for the talk. I, I can see how storytelling can be used on, uh, on trying to convey our work. But uh, I'm interested um, on the scenario when the storytelling doesn't work anymore. Uh, let's say, uh, for example, you have mentioned uh, conspiracy theories, uh, maybe specifically one example are flat writers. So despite the empirical and logical uh, contradictions, uh, their beliefs there still persist. Do you think uh, as science communicators, should we continue to engage them? Do we have to change uh, our strategy on them or are they a lost cause? Yeah. And when you mentioned about uh, the evolutionary uh, advantage of trying yeah. to detect uh, lies, would you say that uh, would you say that evolution has failed? It? Well, it's early days <laughs> for conspiracy theories. I think. Yeah. Um, I, I I think the problem is that there, there's a political motive for some of these conspiracy theories, and that it's not just about a debate about the science. It's much more than that. And, and part of it is understanding where that comes from. So why are these conspiracy theorists, why have they got these weird ideas about vaccines or whatever? And, yeah. and do I try to, try to engage with them on it in a different way because of that? And part of it is, I think, quite relentlessly putting out the right, the right evidence-based facts. And I think it's exhausting. Um, 
but I'm thinking around vaccine hesitancy. I think there's been a lot of work. I have a friend who's um, <clears throat> who did a lot of volunteering in Oxford in the vaccines for COVID. And people came who were really, really scared of being vaccinated and were really on the point of, of walking out, walking away, because they'd heard all these stories. And so she relentlessly sat them down and talked to them and told them, shared with them the evidence and the, and the, you know, the stories there. And often it worked. But it, you know, it's, it's relentless and exhausting and you have to keep doing it. But I think, I think there's a, that, that's important. You have to, we have to do that as scientists. Thank you. Yeah. Right, uh, the clock is coming down. It's six, five, four, three, two, one now. Uh, I was told to just have to stop it. So I apologize for not having you to ask the question. So exactly on the dot, 0 .00 .00. Right. Alison, thank you so much. I learned a lot from you. I'm sure many of them will going to continue to engage with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Olat and Prof. Lim for the discussion.